So, uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, this is an opportunity for me to talk through the rig process with you, uh, maybe give you some insights, a uh, few tips and tricks uh, as to how to best put your proposal together and give you the best chance of being able to put together a successful proposal. Uh, as well as an opportunity to highlight a few of the changes that have happened uh, this round. Uh, if you have been following the research initiation grants that COIL offers, you may have noticed in the uh, RFP for this, uh, this round that we have changed a few things, a few of the requirements for what should be included into the proposal, as well as a few changes within the funding parameters that we have for the proposal. So I'll take this opportunity to kind of walk through all of that uh, give you some background on it, and uh, hopefully address some of the questions you may have. In the chat pod that we've already been using, uh, feel free to type in any questions that you may have, uh, and I will be keeping an eye on that and responding to them as, as quickly as I can. Uh, I also will say at the very outset, right at the beginning here, that we could only do so much in a, in, you know, a one-hour webinar uh, that's being recorded for, for general use. Uh, and what we're going to what we're going to be doing is uh, offering you an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you'd like as well. Uh, so after the conclusion of this program, if if you're interested, uh, feel free to email me, which I'll be putting my email in the box here. Um, you can feel free to email me, and we can have some follow-up discussions. And usually, what those end up being, I do a number of these every uh, every cycle. In fact, I've had almost eight of them so far this round. Uh, which is we just sit down, uh, you tell me about your project, uh, you kind of give me your elevator pitch, and then I will give you uh, honest, unbiased feedback uh, on your proposal and what I think you may need to do to uh, modify it, strengthen it, uh, make it a little bit more brief often. Uh, but I give you some hints and tricks uh, to put you uh, in front of a review committee before you go in front of the review committee. Uh, one of the things that I can bring to the table is the fact that this is now our, uh, our seventh round of these research initiation grants, and I've sat through all of these, these reviewer meetings, uh, have met with, uh, for, let's see, probably over 300 reviewers uh, so far uh, for this program, and I've gotten a, a very good sense of what the reviewers are looking for, and sometimes I can provide some of those insights to you prior to you actually submitting your proposal. What this hour will be about is primarily walking you through what the proposal is and highlighting some of the things that are sticking points for many of our proposers in the past. Uh, time and time again, uh, there are certain things that proposals fail to do uh, that cause them great pain during the review process and have, have often been the difference between being funded and not being funded. I cannot tell you how many times uh, we as a review committee and we as the COIL directors have sat down to talk through a proposal and said, that is a really good idea. Uh, maybe we have some background knowledge on what the project is beyond what the proposal was that is submitted and said, you know, this could have been a proposal that was funded, but it just wasn't written up in the way it needed to be. Uh, and if you've proposed before, for, for particularly for larger grant programs, the NSFs, the IESs, uh, you know that uh, often it is not the idea or the, or the project that is funded or not funded, it's the proposal. It's the way that it's written up. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to help with today. As I said, as we go along, please feel free to type any questions you have in the chat, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. First, I'm Brad Zdenek. Uh, I'm the Innovation Strategist for Center for Online Innovation and Learning, who sponsors the Research Initiation Grants. Uh, and I also uh, I run this rig process. I have since the third round, uh, which basically means that uh, I'm the primary liaison between uh, the uh, the principal investigators in each one of the projects, uh, with the reviewers, uh, with our funding agencies, uh, and with our directorship uh, to make the decisions as to which projects are funded and which projects are not. We'll get into this a little bit later on down the line, but uh, once the proposals are reviewed, those reviews are then brought to the table and the five directors and I sit down and review those the, the uh, results out of the review committee, and then we make the funding decisions they're almost always directly in line uh, with what the reviewers say. But there are times we have to deviate where we feel strongly that perhaps, and this is usually the point, and I'm going to hit this home during our, our talk today, uh, 
uh, usually the sticking point is on the innovation piece, uh, whether or not the thing being proposed is an innovation. And I'm going to come back to this again and again and again, hitting home the innovation piece. But let's take a few steps back. Uh, let's talk about what a rig is and, and what it's intended to be. Uh, so if you want to follow along, uh, you can see it. Uh, I should be sharing my screen here, uh, but that may be a little bit difficult to see. Uh, you can also just visit the website that I have linked up a little bit above where we are chatting, which is coil.psu.edu slash rigs. Uh, you can get to this page at any point by just going to coil.psu.edu. If you go over grants, the second option there is call for rig proposals. And this is our most recent and up-to-date uh, request for proposal, RFP, uh, for this rig process. You'll see basically what we do is we kind of give you an outline. Uh, this is what the rigs are. The rigs are intended to be seed funding. They're intended to be that, that little bit of money, that little bit of support that we can bring to the table for Penn State people. This is Penn State money for Penn State people. A little bit of money that we can bring to the table to help an idea get past that germination stage, to, to give you the support that you need to uh, do a pilot project or to do some initial development on a development project that will position you well for larger external funding a little bit further down the road. We have a, a pretty good track record on this so far. Uh, we have had NSF proposals, we have had IES proposals, actually multiple NSF proposals, uh, as well as uh, a, a few other larger funding agencies, Gates uh, included, uh, funding agencies coming to our projects and picking them up uh, once, the, once the 18 months of this rig process is over with. Uh, one of them within that 18 months, actually, uh, but it was a, a very, very strong idea. So, it's essentially for this proof of concept stage of both research and development projects. Often people get stuck up on the research initiation grant, uh, but some of our research initiation grants are for development projects as well. Uh, so I'll go through a little bit later, I'll go through a few examples of some of our exemplars, uh, and one of those has been a uh, development project that was conducted uh, by a gentleman named uh, Conrad Tucker in the uh, College of Engineering here at University Park at Penn State. Uh, but if we can provide this money to do a use as a stepping stone, uh, Cindy, this is a good example for what you do, just finished your, your uh, doctoral research and you need that, that little bit of a bridge to bridge the gap between where you were and where you want to go, hopefully with some external funding. And that's what the rigs are for. All you have to be uh, in order to get a rig grant uh, and or to have the potential for a successful proposal is some sort of affiliation with Penn State, which means you are faculty, staff, or student uh, here at Penn State, any one of our Commonwealth campuses, just as long as you are a Penn Stater. That said, that is for the principal investigator. We emphasize the importance of collaboration. And if the uh, if the uh, majority of your research team has to be or should be individuals outside of Penn State, that's great. Uh, in fact, you can receive some additional uh, points within the scoring rubric for that. But what we're looking for is the PI, the principal investigator, to be here at Penn State. The rest of the team can be comp composed of individuals uh, from anywhere, from other institution, uh, institutions of higher education, from uh, individuals in the private sector, from individuals uh, that are in nonprofits, uh, or even contracted individuals. Uh, so that's eligibility. Deadline, uh, hopefully you know this one and have it marked on your calendars, 5 p.m. Eastern Time on November 16th. I will show you a link a little bit further down this page uh, that uh, shows you exactly how to submit your proposal, but you'll be submitting your proposal in a single PDF or Word document uh, to an online form and I look at the times when they're submitted and 5 p.m. is the cutoff time. Uh, so please don't miss that date. I, I can't tell you how many people uh, send me an email at 6 o'clock saying, I'm so sorry, I, I missed the deadline. Uh, can, I still, can I still submit? And unfortunately, this has to be a hard and fast deadline because for every person that would communicate to me saying that they missed the deadline, there may be two or three that, that tried to meet that deadline that did not and did not reach out to me. Uh, so to be fair, 5 p.m. is that hard and fast cutoff time. In fact, the uh, form shuts off at, at 5.01, uh, so you wouldn't be able to submit after that anyway. So one of the first questions people ask me when, they, when we talk about the rigs is, 
what exactly can I use this money for? Now let me define first what the money is. This is one of the changes uh, that we have had from past rounds. Uh, we up to this round have funded fifty thousand uh, dollars each round. Uh, for I'm sorry, fifty thousand dollars for each project in each round, uh, and we've supported uh, roughly two hundred thousand uh, dollars in in funding for each round. Uh, so depending on what the average ask was in the proposals, we were funding six, maybe even seven proposals per round. That has changed slightly this time around. Our new cap, our new maximum for a proposal is $40,000, uh, which is still a significant sum, uh, but uh, due to some changes in priorities here at COIL and the need to support the new ed tech initiative here at Penn State, uh, we've slightly modified this rig process. And you may be hearing in the near future about a, uh, a new research initiation grant process that's going to be coming out of COIL focused specifically on ed tech, uh, but that's, that's in the new year. Uh, so $40,000 is the new maximum ask for each one of the proposals. We have also changed the number of proposals that we're going to be funding. So up to uh, this date, our, our acceptance rate for proposals has been between 15 and 20 percent. Uh, I think last round we had 13 percent. Uh, as our rounds have gone along, we've had more and more submissions. In fact, last round we had uh, 32 submissions uh, for that particular round. Uh, but we've funded between six and seven. This new round, we're maximum $40,000 ask, and we're anticipating that we're going to be funding two or three proposals. So you can see the change there, uh, that our acceptance rate is going to drop uh, fairly significantly uh, from six to seven to two to three per round. Uh, so there's going to become a bit more competitive of a process, and you need every advantage that you could possibly get uh, to position yourself well for funding. And that's why, again, I hope you avail yourself to the opportunity uh, to sit down with me and, and talk through your project uh, if you th think that might be helpful. So with those funds, that $40,000, what can you do with it? Well, uh, we list it here on the web page. Um, you can use it for development of new technologies. Uh, that may be, if you're doing a development project, that means you know, the hardware components you would need. One of the projects we funded in the past, Conrad Tucker, that I mentioned, uh, was for a haptic uh, feedback glove that's used for interacting with virtual environments. Uh, what he needed was he needed gloves and sensors and, uh, and, and very small motors and actuators and various things for this glove. He used it for buying uh, that, that hardware that he needed for developing that tool. This may be for a server. This may be for a software platform, whatever it may be that you need for your particular project. You can also use this money to fund research. So that may mean that you need to hire a statistician in order to complete or in order to answer, properly answer your research questions. Uh, you can use this money for uh, hiring a statistician here at the university or for hiring uh, focus groups or anything that you may need to facilitate the research that you're conducting. You can use it for that. There are always the Penn State rules as to how money can be used, and there are some international limitations here uh, that we can get into if it may be applicable to your particular uh, project. Uh, but one of the restrictions that uh, Penn State has is that we cannot hire an individual outside of the United States uh, for contract work. You can be invoiced by a firm that's outside of the United States, but you cannot hire an individual. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Again, if you're looking at uh, some sort of international collaboration, you may want to reach out to me in advance of, uh, of submitting your proposal so we can work through those details. If you need some money in order to help with collaboration, so say you need to buy a Zoom room uh, so that you can do video collaborations during your research project, that's perfectly acceptable use of your funding. If you need to support some sort of travel in order to meet the individuals that are on your research team, or to go to a conference where you can meet up uh, with the research team. That's an acceptable use of, of this $40,000. Uh, technology or equipment that are required for, for conducting your, your experiment or for conducting your research. Um, what we do ask, and one of the things that we bring up with our reviewers to look for, is we do ask that you do not request equipment that should already be available to you. If you are an employee here at Penn State, you already have access, likely, already have access to a computer of some sort. So please do not request a computer for use on this research project. Uh, so those sort of things. Now you can make the case 
that you have not been provided that sort of uh, hardware and you need it, that's fine, but you need to make a case for that uh, in your proposal. You cannot make the assumption that uh, the reviewers will know that you do not that you do not have that equipment. And if a reviewer looks at it and says they should already have that, um, then it may hurt you in the in in your review. Staff compensation for time spent. Uh, so essentially, this is buyout time. Uh, if you are a staff member or you have staff member on your project. And and you need to buy out some of their time in order to dedicate to your project. Uh, this is uh, an acceptable use of the time. So essentially what you do is you would inclu include the number of hours that you think they'd be working. And then most important, you have to include fringe rates. Uh, if you haven't worked with budgets here at Penn State before and you haven't worked with things like fringe and indirect costs, uh, it is very important to include that. Now, this is Penn State money for Penn State people. So if you worked with indirect costs before, uh, luckily, you don't have to deal with that here. Uh, so we're not an external funding agency, so we can get around those indirect costs, and uh, that significantly reduces the, the total budget for a project, luckily. Uh, but fringe is still important, uh, and particularly if you're, uh, if you're paying for a postdoc. Uh, postdoc fringe rate is, I, I believe, 7%, maybe even up, uh, up above that now. Uh, so that can add a significant uh, amount to a salary for that individual. You can have wage individuals, and you can pay their, their uh, wage payrolls using this money. Graduate assistance, probably the number one place that that money is spent uh, on our rigs historically. And we will pay for tuition and stipend. Now, sometimes you can get your department or your, uh, or your college to pick up, say, tuition uh, for the graduate assistantship, and that would help. Uh, most graduate assistantships end up running around the thirty thirty two thousand dollars depends on what level you bring them in at but uh, for forty thousand dollars total budget if a graduate assistant half time takes thirty two you can see that uh, that will take up the the majority of your budget uh, so working out some deals with a college or department to bring some in kind donations uh, is is helpful sometimes and then also reasonable actual replacement costs for faculty members. Uh, Please, we try as hard as you can if you have a faculty member that's going to be spending time on your project not to have that buyout of time done during the normal teaching year. Uh, if they work on a 10-month contract and you want to bring them in for those two months over the summer, that is, that's great. But what we don't want to do is we do not want to be supporting bringing faculty out of the classroom. Uh, so we're very hesitant to fund faculty release. There are times and cases that can be made, but again, it is a, a barrier you'd have to jump over. You'd have to make the case for that faculty release. Uh, summer hours are great, uh, but fall and spring, uh, you, you really need to make a, a, a convincing argument uh, to pull a faculty member out of, out of their normal teaching duties. So funding priorities. This is important because this is slightly different than what we've had before. Uh, in, in the past, our funding priorities have essentially boiled down to, is this project capable of bringing in external grant funding to the university? Uh, in other words, does it have legs? Is it going to go beyond this 18 months of this research initiation grant? Is it going to do anything beyond that? Or are we funding this and then it's going to disappear? So that all, always historically has been our funding priority, just projects that, that have greatest potential. But we've refined that a little bit over the last few research initiation grant rounds, and you can see that in this list here. One of the biggest changes is alignment with uh, COIL's research priorities. And COIL's research prior priorities are essentially twofold. Um, we are focusing our efforts and our money and our resources on personalization and student retention. Now you can see the links between the two. Uh, personalization hopefully leads to student retention as well. Uh, but those are the, the two areas that we're really focusing on. Now, personalization is pretty broad. Uh, that, that is uh, a, an area where, regardless of your project, you can probably make a case for some sort of effect on personalization, uh, as well as student retention. If you're doing something positive toward learning, you can make a case that there is a link with increased student retention. But it may be something that you want to think about when defining your research questions as to whether or not the student retention aspect of your project can be uh, more explicitly stated within your research questions or within your, your uh, narrative. We're also 
uh, prioritizing projects that come in that have that, that considerable promise for enhancing learning. Uh, sometimes projects are three or four steps away from the learning itself. Uh, and are focused a little bit more on teaching or some of the background support services that are necessary for learning to happen. But what we're starting to focus on is more the direct impact on learning. Uh, so that's something you want to get to use to frame your argument as you write your narrative uh, for your proposal, is focusing in again and again and again and asking yourself that question, how does this impact learning? How does this impact learning? How does this impact learning? And answering that question as you write your proposal. Uh, that also has a, uh, a significant effect on the reviewers as they read your proposal because they see how laser focused you may be on learning. And since that is a funding priority for us, it makes an impression on us as funders as well. Demonstrate the potential to stimulate significant proposals for external funding. This is the one I just re referenced. Uh, we don't want these to be 18 month and done projects. Uh, we want these to be seed funds. We want these to be the proof of concept stages of larger projects that are going to bring in other grants. Now, it doesn't have to be a $3 million NSF grant, uh, but some sort of external funding that will allow this project to continue on beyond the funding that we're able to provide. So internally to Penn State, $40,000 is, is a very nice grant. Uh, most of the colleges and departments don't offer grants of this size. So usually they're five, six, seven thousand uh, dollars $7,000. So relatively large grants inside the university, but as far as grants go, these are, these are, uh, these are relatively small. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to position you well to get those larger external grants. And again, you don't have to stretch and make the case that you're going to have a $5 million grant coming in. But if you can make the case that there is some sort of funding agency out there and there's some sort of program out there that will come after this research initiation grant is over and make certain that the project does not die, that is what we're looking for here. And that's a case that you'd have to make throughout your proposal. And there's a specific place to do that, and I'll get to that in a second. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, collaborative effort is, is rewarded. We know that often the best person to be on your project, the person that's going to be able to help you the most in, in a, a conducting a successful experiment or development project is not the person sitting right next to you. It's probably someone that's either at a different campus, or in a different college, in a different department, uh, in a different field. Uh, whoever that may be, we want you to be looking for the best people to bring on your team, not the people that are closest to you. Uh, so that's not saying that, that you, you can't have uh, interdepartment participation and partnerships, but we want you to think outside of the silo that you may be in or that you may have a, a tendency to fall into and think of who else you can bring onto your project. And we have an amazing amazing research community here at Penn State across all the Commonwealth campuses. And, and I, I love seeing that, that we have Mount Alto uh, uh, representation here because it is challenging sometimes to get the message out to the Commonwealth campuses and get participation in. And the, the hunger, the need, and the desire and, and capacity and expertise is there. It's just getting the message across. So if you're looking at putting together a project, if you are at a Commonwealth campus, reach out to some of the other campuses and see if there are potential collaborators there. Uh, if you're here at University Park, think about reaching out to some of the Commonwealth campuses and, and finding individuals that would be able to bring something to your team. If not that, think of some other universities. Uh, some of our most successful uh, proposals have included, uh, in, in one case, dozens of researchers from across other uh, universities. Uh, the, there is uh, there's a great benefit in that, and that's one of the projects that has had uh, the most success post research initiation grant. Uh, and uh, if if you're uh, familiar with Rand Clements, it was a, a CIC MOOC, uh, and I'll, I'll show you where to find that a little bit later if you want to look into that project and see what an example of an exemplar uh, is uh, for for a collaborative project. And then we also say uh, collaborations with other institutions. Funding guidelines, I already gave you this, up to $40,000. We're expecting to fund three to four proposals. It depends on what the average is. If we average at $40,000 uh, uh, for each proposal, we'll probably fund three. Uh, if we have our, 
our at normal average, which is about thirty-five thousand dollars, thirty thousand uh, dollars, then we may be able to fund four. Uh, we'll we'll have to take a look at that uh, once the reviews are in and once the projects are submitted. Total number of proposals we're expecting. Uh, this is actually a good round to be in. Uh, this is usually our smaller round uh, as far as submissions go. Uh, but last fall we received 24, I'm sorry, 26 proposals. Uh, last spring we received 32. Uh, so you can see a little bit of a difference there. So we're expecting somewhere in the mid 20s to, to low 30s as far as total number of proposals being submitted. So you can see how competitive this, uh, this particular program has, has turned out to be. Uh, our first round we had, I believe, nine proposals. Uh, so you can see that with popularity uh, and, and with word of mouth, this program has become increasingly competitive. So we do our absolute best to conduct these reviews as quickly as we can. In fact, we go from submission deadline to final notice of approval or, uh, or revise and resubmit within one month of, of that date. Uh, so we go as quickly as we can uh, to conduct the reviews. And what you will receive, regardless of funding decision, is you will re receive an enormous amount of substantive feedback from the reviewers on your proposal. And I will tell you that one of the things we looked at is we looked at um, the success rate of proposals in, that have been submitted more than once. So essentially those individuals that take the feedback uh, that are given to them by reviewers and then resubmit in a, in a subsequent funding cycle. And that success rate has been over 70%. Take that in for a second. Over 70% success rate in resubmits uh, in, in subsequent funding cycles. That review feedback you get is, is, is enormously beneficial. Not just for the research initiation grant process, uh, but also if you're going for other funding as well. You can take the feedback that you get from this process and you can incorporate it and help refine your proposal for any grant program that you go after. I often tell individuals, when I have these sit-down conversations and I have to be blunt and honest, I say, you know, I just don't see the innovation in this project. I don't think this is the right program for you. I, I personally don't think that you're going to be funded uh, given the state of the innovation in your project, but submit anyway. Because what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to get that feedback from the reviewers and it's going to be beneficial and even if you're not funded, you can use that feedback to go after a different grant that may be better aligned with whatever research project you're looking to do. This is a particular research uh, initiation grant uh, looking for particular types of projects and you may have a wonderful research project or development project. It just may not be right for this. Uh, so let's get into what this is. Huh. The proposal submission guidelines, what you're going to be sending us is pretty straightforward and, and pretty short. Uh, so before I get into this, let me say one thing. One of the best things that you can do, this is pro tip number one, uh, one of the best things that you can do that, that proposers often do not is take this, this web page right here, print it off, make little check boxes right next to each one of these elements for the proposal submission guidelines and make sure you check off each one when you prior to uploading your your PDF I cannot tell you how many projects I have had to send a an email a very difficult email saying I'm sorry but you did not submit this part of the proposal your proposal will not be sent to the reviewers for review uh, and that's a really hard email to send but the instructions are right here. They're available to you. It's as, it's as easy as printing this out and making sure you check off each one of these boxes as you go along and making sure all this information is included. If elements of this proposal are missing, your, your proposal will not be sent along to the reviewers to review. So, yeah, I, I, I hope so. You'd be very surprised at some of the individuals that do not. <laughs> Uh, Cindy, sorry. Uh, you'd be very surprised how many individuals do, do not check off all of the boxes and um, it's a shame because there have been a few proposals where after I read it I thought that would have been funded. There's no question in mind that project would have been funded but they did not do blank. Uh, they didn't put in a, uh, a budget. 
or they did not have a dissemination plan. The difference between a funded and non-funded project uh, in these research initiation grants is usually two to three points in the review process. And we'll get to the points in a second, but it's minuscule. That is, that is a dissemination plan. If you don't include a dissemination plan, you're out of the running. Uh, and, and that's a shame, so please do that. Uh, cover page. We asked for the title of your project. You can read all this. I'm not going to go through each one of the bullet points. Uh, but I will highlight one of the things that we do ask, and that is these two points here. The name of financial officer or admin assistant who will be uh, processing your expenses, and the name of human resources contact uh, that will be uh, helping you with any sort of hiring. And the reason we need to have this at the, at the very outset is that sometimes we have to reach out to these individuals during the review process to ask them questions about the budget or ask them process questions about what that college or department allows or does not allow uh, in order to help inform some of our funding decisions. And these individuals will be contacted uh, immediately upon your receipt of the grant as well uh, because they are going to be involved in the very beginning. Uh, always the finance officer or the admin assistant, sometimes the human resources contact depending on, on what your money is being spent on. And please tell us when funds are needed. Uh, so I keep, I've keep i been saying 18 months. Uh, these are one-year grants, uh, but the money is available for 18 months within that. Uh, in this round, you will receive the funding decision uh, in the beginning of December. January, when you get back from break, the money will be available to you. But you may not be ready to start working in, in January. So if you tell us that your timeline for your project starts in May, that's fine. Just let us know what that timeline is so we can better orient uh, our resources and what we'll be able to do to help you. Yes, uh, Jacob, as far as the uh, human, re well, you know what, I'll take that back. Uh, the finance officer or administrative assistant may or may not be at your campus. The admin assistant, I am guessing, is. Uh, but depending on your college or department, the structures for that are, are different depending on where you are. And it makes it very difficult to give a, a standard answer of yes or no. Uh, the best thing to do is to find the admin assistant that processes any of your financials right now related to anything that you may, do, may be doing and ask them who your FO is. Uh, and whether that FO is at there at your campus or not. Essentially what we need to know is we need to know who the individual is that has, that's along their approval path for any expenditures you make uh, because they need to be involved and informed as to how we process financials. Uh, so uh, anyone that would be in that approval path for charges you would have or, uh, or costs you would incur during the, during the uh, completion of your project, those are the individuals we need to know. Usually that's at your campus, but not always. I know in engineering it's a little bit complicated. Oh, I, and I see you're engineering. So engineering sometimes is a little complicated because uh, essentially those individuals are housed here at UP. Uh, so you're going, to have, you're going to have to navigate that and take a look. If I can help in any way, send me an email and I'll, I'll try to help, uh, help you move through that system and figure out who, who does what, uh, but I do not know offhand. Uh, but admin assistant is always the best place to start. Uh, they're, they're the ones that run this university anyway, uh, and, and, and your admin assistant will probably know where to direct you. Uh, so when funds are needed, that's all the cover page. Uh, so that's essentially one page. Uh, it's not limited to one page, but usually all of this information fits on one page of your proposal. Then these next three things, or I'm sorry, four things, can often fit on one page as well sometimes a little bit over a page. Uh, but these also are not limited by page, they're limited by words. We're asking for four things, and one of these things is new this, this round. The first one is just an abstract. you used to this. 200 word, maximum 200 word abstract of what is your project. Please abide by these word limits. I received, I think, two or three proposals last time that had two page abstracts. Uh, that's not what we're asking for, and it will be sent back to you uh, if you do that. 200-word abstract. If you do 201 words, uh, don't sweat over it. Uh, but if you do 400 words, there's a problem. If you do 300 words, it's a problem. If you do 250 words, it's a problem. 200 words. 
you have to go within these limits. So 200 word abstract. And then these next three are, are critically important for our reviewers. And, and these can make or break a proposal. Uh, because this is also the information right at the beginning of your proposal. So this is what orients the reviewers to what you're about to give them in the narrative. Uh, and it primes them for what you're about to give. Well-written uh, abstracts in these three areas can, uh, can bias the reviewer toward your proposal. However, spelling errors, grammatical errors in this section uh, can, can sink your proposal fast. So uh, after the 200-word abstract, we ask for a 200-word description of why is this an innovation? Give me your elevator pitch. You're stuck in the elevator with me. The door is just closed. You have 200 words to get out. Why is this innovative? That's what you put right here. Now, you can expound upon that uh, throughout the narrative where you'll have five pages to do that. But here, be succinct. And it's hard. It's really hard. And this one's hard and the next couple are hard as well. But in 200 words, do your best to tell me why is this innovative? Why is this different? And I'll define innovation in just a minute, or how we define innovation in just a minute. 200 words impact on learning. So how, how is this going to affect learning in any way? 200 words. Just let me know. Again, you, you can give me much, much more in the narrative. But here I want it as succinct and clear as possible. And then this one is new, the alignment with COIL research priorities. I told you about this in the funding priorities. Uh, here it's, it's, it's a reality of something that you have to write. 200 words, tell me how does your project align with either personalization or student retention. Uh, and you have to be succinct. And it's really hard to do that in 200 words, but we ask you to do that here. Now all these can, this can be four separate pages, this can all be on one page, uh, that is completely up to you. Uh, all you have to do is abide by the limitations that we put in the parentheses here. Uh, so if you give us an abstract, innovation, impact on learning, and alignment with COIL research priority statements, uh, you're good there. And then you move into the body of things, the narrative. Five pages, double spaced, 12 point font, one side of the page only. If you're doing this digitally, that makes sense, but uh, we try to be as explicit as we can in these instructions. Uh, so five pages you have to tell us what is your project. So what is the description of your project? Uh, what are your research questions? And please make certain that you include research or development questions uh, or research questions in here. Uh, the research questions may be related to the eff uh, effectiveness or efficacy of the development project that you have, uh, but research questions should be included in here. Uh, a brief description of the methodology or the design and the design, uh, data analysis, the, the typical things uh, that you would have in a research project like this, if applicable. If you're doing a development project, you may not be doing uh, a data analysis procedure, but you may have a design framework that you're working in. Uh, so you'd have to, to provide that to us. Uh, and then finally, a brief description of any sort of research that you've already conducted or has been conducted in, in this field or in this area before. In an innovation project, sometimes there's not going to be much there. Uh, but if there is, please let us know. Pro tip number two, uh, one of the things that happens very often in these reviewer meetings is some one of the reviewers raises their hand in the meeting or in the comments uh, of, of their review and says, I know someone who was doing this five years ago. Now, if you were sitting at that review table, you'd be able to say, well, I understand what you're talking about, but what they were doing five years ago was not what I'm doing. It was this, whereas I'm doing that. In your narrative, you have the opportunity to uh, dismiss some of those criticisms of this has already been done before. Uh, so it is always best to directly address those things. And if there is one thing that is going to help you most in your proposal, it is doing this. Addressing what has been done in the past and telling us how what you're doing is different. We had a project last round that I am still convinced was an innovative project. But the proposer just just didn't quite communicate it. You had to read between the lines. It did sound like something that had been done before, but I don't think it was. But the case has to be made in the proposal. We can't read between the lines when, when conducting these reviews. 
So if you can tell us what has been done in the past and, and, and then put yourself in comparison to that and what you're doing in comparison to that to show us how it's different, that can go a long, long way. So this narrative section, uh, this is five pages. It includes those things that, uh, that I just described, as well as a description of your need for funding. Uh, so why do you need money for this? Uh, this is not a budget. This is just basically, uh, you know, it has, it has considerable promise to affect learning. Uh, it, uh, Penn State needs to do this. Uh, this is an area of development within Penn State. If you're doing something ed techy, uh, it aligns with President Barron's initiatives. Uh, something like that. Uh, some way of describing why we should be funding this. Uh, giving us any sort of plans for submission to external agencies. Uh, if you have a specific program that you'd be uh, applying to, that's great. Uh, but what we want to make certain is that you are looking, you have surveyed the landscape and you have been looking for places where you may be able to get some external money after this 18 months is over. Uh, if you are not able to tell us that you're thinking about that, then this is no longer seed funding. Uh, we don't know where this may be going. So we really need you to tell us where you're looking and uh, where funding may be available down the line. That doesn't need to mean that you have submitted or that you guarantee you are going to submit for those things. But we want to know that you are surveying the landscape uh, and that you are tuned in to funding sources for your research area. You have to include enough specificity so that the reviewers can review your proposal, but please don't get uh, bogged down in jargon and and special and language that only specialists in your area would be able to to read. Uh, we do try to match our reviewers uh, with their areas of expertise. However, there are going to be reviewers on your committee that are not uh, in your same area, and and often with innovations, you're working within a niche area. And there may only be three or four people at the university that understand what you're doing, and they're probably on your project. Uh, so you need to write your proposal in such a way that non-specialists can, can read and understand it and, and uh, review it in, in a meaningful way. And lastly, a proposed timeline for your study. Uh, how, how long is this going to take? Uh, what are your major milestones? So everything I just gave here, and I'll highlight it on the page, everything here under this main bullet is part of your five pages. So now you have your cover page, you have your uh, overviews and your abstracts, and then you have a five page narrative including all of these things. If you need references, you can in include references but not more than a page worth. Supporting materials, uh, anything else that you think needs to be included to make your case. Uh, maybe you've done a pilot project. Uh, Cindy, there's a good example for you. Maybe you've got some results uh, from a pilot project that you did uh, during your, your dis dissertation, and you've got some things that you can include here um, that may be very useful. If you have an instrument, you're going to be using a survey instrument, uh, that would be very useful here. What I would caution you against is overload. Our reviewers will be reviewing three to four proposals. If you give them a 40-page proposal, I can guarantee you they are not going to read those 40 pages. Uh, they are not required to include to read through every bit of the supporting material. They are required to read through the rest, uh, but supporting material is somewhat optional. So include what you what you should include, but edit. Uh, to, to be be as brief and succinct as you can in what you include. Uh, a rubric would, you know, would be would be very beneficial. If that's a rubric that you're going to be using in your research study, uh, that can really help to to show uh, the reviewers what you're going to be doing. Uh, screenshots, if you're doing anything online, if you're building any sort of interface, screenshots are very helpful here. Uh, so that'd be something that you'd be able to put in, uh, as well as in the supporting material section, brief summaries of your team members' capabilities. Uh, so. Many of us know each other, uh, but some of us don't. Uh, so please, just give a brief bio of everyone uh, so when the reviewers are reviewing and they need to see whether or not the team can actually do this research, they can look at those bios and see where their areas of expertise are uh, and, and get a good sense. So you will see there is no word limit here uh, or page limit, but I would encourage you uh, to, to be as brief as you can uh, in this section for supporting materials. 
estimated budget. Uh, this is one thing that gets a lot of people. Uh, we have had difficulty with budgets in the past uh, because budgets have been uh, uh, improperly formatted uh, or have not included fringe rates or have uh, figured salaries incorrectly and the like. Uh, because of that, we are now requiring that everyone use the PSU SIMS tool, which is the standardized tool for budgeting and finance used uh, across the university. You may or may not have access to SIMS yourself. Your administrative assistant may, and your finance officer definitely does. Uh, you may also have a, a grants person uh, available to you uh, that may be able to help you out here. Uh, but uh, essentially, get someone to give you access to the SIMS tool or to build your budget in the SIMS tool. It takes minutes, as long as you know what you're including. Uh, and, and they can build out the SIMS tool for you. They'll give you a essentially a screenshot or a printout that you can include in your proposal, and there your entire budget is done for you. And if we see that it's done in, in the SIMS tool, we know that it is accurate. Uh, and again, if you need help finding the person that can give you access to the SIMS tool, I would be more than willing to try to help, uh, but you'd probably be better positioned to find that person than I would be. I would encourage you to reach out sooner than later. Uh, to get access to the SIMS tool uh, and to build that budget. Uh, reason being, you don't necessarily know that if a person is going to be available uh, that day before the proposal is due in order to walk through this with you. Uh, it will be better to do it in advance, do as much detail as you can, and then you can refine it down the line. Uh, so please, use the SIMS tool and include that budget. We also ask you um, to uh, to Oh, I'm sorry, there we go. But we also ask you to include a narrative uh, along with that budget. So the SIMS tool gives us the numbers. It's essentially a spreadsheet. Uh, but in addition to that, give us a little narrative to explain what those line items are. Uh, and then after funding decisions have been made, we'll work with you to refine that budget if necessary, uh, as well as if we, there are times when we will decide to fund, a partially fund a project, and we'll come back to you and say, um, you asked for thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. We can't. We can't do that for thirty-five thousand dollars, or we wouldn't fund your proposal for that. But we 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 are willing to bring twenty-five to the table. Uh, so if that's the case, then we'll help you work through uh, refining that budget. Uh, generally, we we strive to do full funding from the ask that you have. Uh, but if it's a difference between funding and not funding, we try to to meet you in the middle if possible. Uh, I have in here, don't forget to include fringe, but if you use SIMS tool, you don't have to worry about that. Do not include indirect costs because it's Penn State money for Penn State people. Uh, but again, if you use a SIMS tool, you don't have to worry about that. And then for graduate assistance, including tuition and stipend, again, if you use a SIMS tool, you don't have to worry about that. You can see why we want people to use a SIMS tool. Uh, it just uh, reduces error considerably. And finally, one page dissemination plan. Uh, how are you going to let people know about your work? Uh, it would be a great thing to say, hey, I don't know if you've ever been part of one of our COIL conversations, uh, but we do these things here at COIL called COIL conversations. Uh, you can see them up in the events menu at the top of the screen. Uh, but that's a great way of disseminating your project. And then you've got the standard conference proceeding, or uh, conference attendance and, and uh, presentations, as well as journal articles and, and the like. Uh, so dissemination plan is pretty clear cut. So here I tell you exactly what you need to, uh, to send in and a link, to, uh, a link to the actual submission form. And you'll see for the submission form, you put in your name, your email, how many people are on your team, and these are named individuals, so named individuals on your research team. What are your keywords for your project? This helps us uh, assign reviewers uh, related to your area. Uh, where are you from? or not just where you're from, uh, what campuses are represented in your entire team. Uh, and then you upload your proposal in Word or PDF format. It's as easy as that. Uh, you will receive a confirmation email as soon as you do, and that will uh, let you know that your proposal has been successfully submitted. Proposal review, we have about 50 to 60, actually I think we're up to 57 uh, reviewers for this round already. So we have 50 to 60 reviewers, uh, some very experienced, some not very experienced. Uh, we use this as, a, as an opportunity for teaching and mentoring uh, uh, young academics as well. Uh, so 
Uh, we have a number of reviewers with varying skill levels that will be uh, that will be reviewing proposals. What we do is we purposefully uh, assign proposals with representation from some of our uh, more senior, more experienced reviewers, uh, balanced out as well with some of our newer reviewers, so that you don't have a a team of all students uh, reviewing your proposal. Uh, you also won't have a, a team of all uh, senior faculty uh, reviewing your proposal. You'll have a balance uh, across a member of faculty, staff, and students uh, on your proposal uh, review committee. Here, I, I'm not going to go too much through this except for the, the first point here of innovation uh, because you can kind of read this, but this is the criteria. Uh, this is another one where uh, one of the one of the easiest things that you can do to uh, to ensure that your proposal has the best chance of funding is to give this criteria to someone you know and have them review your proposal before you submit it. Uh, and I give the criteria here and I'll show you the link to the rubric in just a second. Uh, but there's a rubric you can download as well. Uh, but this is what we will look at and this is exactly what our reviewers get when they're told to re review your proposals. Uh, so we try to be as transparent as possible. The one thing that I will focus on here, because the rest of it you can read on your own, but the one thing I will focus on is innovation. What do we mean by innovation? And you would be surprised how many definitions there are out there. Uh, but the way COIL has defined innovation is it is a research development or, uh, or introduction of something new or novel, uh, be it an, an idea, a device, advice, uh, an approach, a pedagogical approach, uh, with the intent on improving learning. Now what is not an innovation? An innovation is not a refinement of an existing process technology or approach. You say, oh, this tool does almost what I need, but I need to tweak it just a little bit uh, to meet my needs. That is not an innovation. Innovation is also not taking an existing approach or technique or tool and applying it to a new context. Uh, a good example here, one of, the, one of the examples I always give is that we had uh, one project uh, that was uh, essentially just-in-time mentoring uh, using uh, a, a video mentoring system. Um, this is something that's been common in private sector for a long time. It's been used in teaching for a long time and training new teachers. Uh, just-in-time mentoring, particularly with a video element, is not new or novel. However, the case here was that it had not been used in the medical field and that it was going to be a new way of mentoring individuals in the medical field. It may be. That may be new or novel in the medical field, but it is not new or novel overall. And so that was uh, deemed as a not innovative project uh, by our strict definition. So we're not looking for something that's already been done, but you just want to do it in a new context. We're looking for the new thing, the new approach, the new device. The, uh, the new idea, uh, that is what innovation is. And we give you a, a few bullet points here to help you refine, help our reviewers refine what innovation is. Uh, but this is a big sticking point because you're going to be doing this, you're going to be defining it in that 200 word section in the beginning as well as in the narrative uh, as far as what your innovation is. So innovation, 10 points, biggest, uh, uh, largest number of points for, for any of the sections. Uh, the most you can get is 10 points in any section. Enhancing learning, we give you some bullet points there, 10 points as well. Alignment with COIL's theme of personalization, 10 points. Can the research and development team do this? Five points. Applicability, which means essentially, is it useful outside of the particular context you have? Uh, five, uh, five points as well. Cost effectiveness, is it worth the money that you're asking for? Seven points. Feasibility, can it be done in a year to 18 months? Five points. Research evaluation plan, so this is basically what are your research questions and how are you actually looking at the effectiveness or efficacy of, of what you're doing, uh, 10 points. Can it uh, generate additional research funding, 5 points. And finally, dissemination plan, 3 points. As I said earlier, the difference between a funded and non-funded proposal is often about 3 points. There you go. Uh, so if you forget that, you're essentially out of the running. Uh, which is harsh, but that's unfortunately just the way it is. You can download here uh, by clicking on that link a rubric that will be given to our reviewers uh, to use while reading your proposal. Uh, so please download this, read through it, and take a look and use it against your proposal. 
uh, before you before you send it in or have even better have some of your friends do so past highly rated proposals uh, I will say that uh, these do not obviously reflect the changes that we made in this particular call for proposals uh, so don't use these as as templates uh, but they are good examples uh, particularly of innovation uh, to take a look at those uh, we tell you what we expect out of you uh, basically if you do if you are funded uh, we will expect quarterly and final reports which are very brief maybe five ten minutes to complete those uh, and that we expect you to uh, participate in the in the COIL community, which means uh, going to conferences, particularly the TLT symposium here at, that happens in March here at UP, uh, great little conference for Penn State people. Um, so that's one thing we ask you to do, uh, as well as being open to doing a COIL conversation with us and the like. And finally, uh, down here at the bottom, there'll be a recording of this session that will be posted up tomorrow. Uh, and you can see, if you want, you can see a recording of the training that I do for our reviewers. Uh, so it kind of gives you a bit of an insight as to how the reviewers are trained and what they'll be looking for when they review your proposal. Um, that's basically it. Uh, the only other thing that I will point out is under grants, you can also click on rig index and you can see a list of all the projects that we have funded in the past. This, again, is a, is a nice way of being able to see what do we consider an innovation uh, and getting a sense of what we find to be innovative, as well as looking at the breakdown of, of teams and what teams look like on uh, funded projects. So we're just about right at time, uh, and uh, I've had a couple questions as, as we went along here, but are there any lingering questions uh, that you may have? And while you're thinking about those and or typing them in, I will uh, do the, uh, the appeal one last time uh, to, to uh, reach out to me if you are at all interested in having a one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, and Jacob, if you, you want to do that you know, via Skype or even we can set up one of these meeting rooms and just activate both of our mics, we can do that. Uh, and, uh, and Cindy, if you, if you want to just meet, uh, we can you know, meet for coffee and sit down for an hour and talk about your project, uh, we can do that. Uh, but please avail yourself of those opportunities uh, if, if you think they'd be at all helpful. I am more than glad to do that. So I see you're both typing, so I'll give you a second to do that. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think I covered just about everything here. Sure. Um, if you don't mind, Jacob, to throw, your, throw your email into the chat box here. And uh, I will uh, send you an email immediately afterward, and we can schedule something. Uh, and, and like I said, talk through what your project is. And, uh, and Cindy, if you want to do the same, uh, that would be great as well. Perfect. And I promise you, um, I'm actually uh, going to be out sick the rest of the day. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I'm, I'm actually quite ill right now. Uh, so I'm probably going to be heading home soon after this. I'll send these emails out, but as far as uh, corresponding back and forth on scheduling, uh, that might have to, uh, to, uh, to happen tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will try my best to schedule something in the, in the very near future. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll do a, a closing here, uh, particularly for our recording. Thank you for attending. Uh, and let me know if there's absolutely anything that we can do for you. There's Penn State money for Penn State people, and we really, not only do we want to help each other, but we want to help improve and move learning forward here at Penn State University to help our students. So thank you very much, and I, I hope that you gain something out of this. Have a great day.